Although at that moment he was traveling a lot. It was before you went to Gainesville also. So it was in 92, 92, 93 when we met. Okay, so long connection. What I do remember from Guillermo is that he taught a number of us in Syracuse a Spanish card game <laughs> called Moose. And uh, I, I haven't played since, so I might be rusty on the rules. One thing I do remember that uh, is that a significant amount of communication took place by facial expressions, like winking and eye. And so, but I promise that I will give you the signs to the end of your time, <laughs> not by the facial expressions, but by explicit signs. So please. Thank you very much. So yeah, I met uh, Jurek. I think it was in 92. And the other thing is that, uh, well, uh, I mean, I'm not going to, to tell jokes or stories because the best one that, that, that I share with Jurek, when it happened, he, he told me, you know the worst part of it is that you are going to tell this story once and again and again, I will not be pleased. And since I want you to be happy, I will not tell it here, okay? <laughs> uh, the other thing is that I also remember in, in Tux that you approached the table, we were having dinner with my students and you told me, Guillermo, I cannot understand anything that you say in your talk, but you tell very good stories. So today I'm going to try to do the, the opposite. I'm going to try to explain me a little bit better and not tell stories about our anecdotes, okay? So let me start then. As uh, Jorma was saying, uh, I'm going to, to go fast and review a little bit what is this approach to, to the application of, of loop quantum gravity to cosmology. So we are now in a situation in cosmology in which we have better and better observations. This has been called, in a certain sense, precision uh, cosmology. It is true that it's uh, starting to be the case that we can falsify certain theoretical cosmological models. Even it may be that there are some tensions, for instance, in the CMB, okay? Uh, more or less the, the impression that we have is that at the, at the best of cases, uh, we will be able to falsify certain models just by a statistical significance when we use many data, observational data, not just once. Okay, this can be, for instance, uh, the CMB spectra, non gaussianities even gravitational waves, and putting everything together, maybe, maybe we will be able to falsify Theoretical predictions, and this includes, obviously, uh, effects that can come from quantum gravity and quantum cosmology. This is the challenge, okay? We know that it's very difficult, but again, this is uh, what we as physicists and scientists should try to do. Uh, in the case of perturbations, okay, more or less this is what one would have in mind before trying to do anything in quantum cosmology. The first thing is that, okay, we should I need a description is gauge invariant in the sense that it's independent of how we describe the background, the manifold up to perturbative diffeomorphisms. Uh, second thing is that if we are going to quantize, it's better that we have a canonical formulation. Okay, this was done first for the perturbation, I would say, the Langlois, and then extended by Pinto Neto and uh, collaborators of mine uh, for the case of including also a background. And there was also work done by Jurek with Andrea Ampukta. Uh, the only thing, if I'm not wrong, they use gate fishing. And the next thing is that uh, you want a quantum treatment in which everything is included, okay? Uh, also a background, then it should be done with the two things together. This was first uh, attempted by Halliwell and Hawking, Shirai and Bada, and there was also contribution by Jurek. Uh, like trying to do quantum field theory and quantum background, okay? So the starting model, again, simple, is that we take a homogeneous isotropic cosmology, we couple a scalar field, can have a potential, and the only thing for simplicity, I will assume that we have compact uh, sections. This is good because in this case, uh, zero modes can be isolated, okay? This is an advantage. In particular, when you expand the action, uh, the linear contributions uh, disappear, uh, irrespectively that uh, you are uh, expanding around a solution of Einstein equation or not. Essentially, because the integration on the spatial sections 
only will give you zero mode. If you treat the zero modes exactly, then the term disappears, and then the first perturbative contribution would be quadratic. Okay. I will focus just on scalar perturbations, although the treatment is general for, for all kinds of perturbations. And so for the background, uh, essentially the geometry will be described by a scale factor. You have the scalar field, like an inflaton, and then you expand the inhomogeneities in a Fourier basis, for instance, a real one with sines and cosines. Uh, they are described just by the wave vector of this uh, Fourier expansion. The frequency is the normal square. And for the scalar perturbations, you have the coefficients, the Fourier coefficients that come into the labs, the shift, the scalar field. And in the special metric, you have a trace part and a traceless part. Okay? And with this choice of coefficients and these uh, variables, you have like a canonical set to describe your system. And the Hamiltonian up to this uh, truncation at quadratic order is given in this way. You have linear perturbations of the uh, momentum constraint and the scalar constraint. And in the case of the zero mode of the scalar Hamiltonian constraint, you get a, a, a quadratic contribution of the perturbations. It's similar, in fact, to if you read the, the paper of Einstein in 1980 about gravitational waves, it's similar to what happens there. Uh, this, uh, let's say, linear uh, gauge transformations uh, should simply change the description of the degrees of freedom that should be unphysical. Uh, however, you want to consider energy uh, or to, to take into account energy consideration, you will have a quadratic contribution to the energy okay, of the perturbations. For the homogeneous part, uh, you have uh, the square of the inflaton momentum. Then you have a contribution of uh, the geometry and the potential. Okay, this is like the Friedman equation, in fact. Okay, so this uh, linear uh, perturbative constraint generate perturbative diffeomorphism and gauge invariant essentially are perturbative variables that are invariant under those transformations. So that it does not depend on the way in which you are identifying the manifold up to this perturbative diffeomorphism. Okay, for the scalar perturbations, the most uh, common ones, even more if you have flat. Uh, uh, sections, uh, special sections, are the Mohan or Sasaki gauge invariants. So, essentially, for the perturbations, the idea is to complete a canonical set using those invariants. Uh, we can use uh, their canonical momenta. There are also gauge invariants that are not in the literature. The only thing there is a certain ambiguity because you can always uh, add a term that is linear in the configuration variables to them. And this can be fixed essentially by demanding that the Mohan Sasaki uh, Hamiltonian does not have cross terms, or equivalent, equivalently that the time derivatives in conformal time of the uh, Mohan Sasaki invariants are proportional to the moment. Okay. Uh, for the linear perturbative constraint at this order of uh, truncation in the perturbation, it's possible to find an abelianization of them. And there is this momenta that are canonical, complete a canonical set for the perturbations. And this uh, momenta can be thought of essentially as uh, gauge uh, degrees of freedom that are unphysical. You can just give any constant value to them. Okay, it's completely relevant for the description of the system. So this is essentially what Langlois introduced. But the problem is that this canonical transformation of the perturbations depends on the background. Okay, so it mixes the, the canonical structure with the zero modes. And uh, I mean, the good news is that it is possible to find new uh, canonical variables for the background. The problem, uh, in a certain sense, for that is that the corrections that you have to add is quadratic in the perturbations, but it's completely consistent in the quadratic truncation of the action. Okay, this x correspond to the perturbative variables. Uh, w is uh, essentially zero modes. Okay, q 
Q is for configuration and P is for momentum. And these are the wave uh, vectors, or wave numbers, and L describes the different degrees of freedom that you can have in the perturbation. Okay. So uh, the expression is general, can be applied to, to any uh, uh, system that, that you, you use uh, in this uh, hierarchy, perturbative hierarchy. And for the uh, momentum of the zero modes, the only thing that changes is this sign here. Okay. And then, in the case of the Hamiltonian, uh, the zero mode of the Hamiltonian constraint, it was evaluated in the all zero modes. Now you have to change those canonical variables. And then it's like a Taylor expansion. And remember that we are truncated at quadratic order. So only the first term contributes because the difference uh, in the zero modes is already quadratic in the perturbations. Okay. Uh, if you do this, then you can see that the new Hamiltonian for the perturbation, which is the addition of these two terms, okay, is simply the Muhana Sasaki Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian that generates the dynamics of the Muhana Sasaki variables up to gauge. This means that up to contributions that go with the a linear perturbative constraints. Okay? And then you rearrange things a little bit, and essentially what you get is this Abelianized linear perturbative constraints with new Lagrange multipliers and the Hamiltonian, the zero mode of the Hamiltonian constraint for the uh, background in the new canonical variables and then the Mohanan Sasaki contribution. This is a, a small, let's say, ambiguity in the way in which you define this because you can always use the, uh, let's say, the uh, background part of this Hamiltonian constraint to re-express the square of the momentum of the inflaton in terms of contributions of the uh, sorry of the scale factor and the potential of the inflaton. Okay, I don't know whether it's here. Yeah, you can use this thing to re-express the square of this momentum in terms of the other two things. And if you think a little bit, this only will redefine the lapse function in the truncation that you have in the action, okay? Then you can fix the ambiguity just by asking that in the perturbative contribution, uh, the uh, inflaton momentum appears only in linear, uh, in a linear way, okay? So this is the most sensible way of doing it. Okay, so in this sense, the system is prepared for quantization. The idea of the hybrid quantization, in fact, is very si simple. The physical approximation is that, uh, based also in the experience that we have in cosmology, we expect that the most relevant uh, quantum geometry effects will be those that uh, affect, uh, let's say, the zero modes, the scale factor. So we use for it a description uh, uh, coming, for instance, from loop quantum gravity. And for the inhomogeneities, then we assume that it's possible to arrive in certain approximation to a quantum field theory uh, description uh, using Fock quantization, okay? Uh, this will work if uh, the canonical set that we have uh, in the quantization uh, does not mix, I mean, essentially the zero modes is still commute with the perturbations in the quantization. And for simplicity, I will use a representation in which the inflaton acts by multiplication, okay? <coughs> With respect to the Fock representation of the homogeneities, let me say only that it's possible to, to find a family in which all the quantizations are unitarily equivalent by demanding that the uh, isometries of the spatial section of the background are implemented as, uh, let's say, the, the vacuum of the Fock quantization is varying under, under them. And then finding uh, uh, creation and annihilation operators uh, for which the high symmetry evolution can be implemented uh, uh, unitarily, okay? Uh, this uh, selects like a family in which all the possible uh, choices of representation are equivalent under unitary transformations, but does not select a unique state, okay? There is an infinite number of focus states in those representations. 
For the linear perturbative constraint, essentially the idea is to represent them as a derivative of, in an integrated version, just as translation. So a physical state will not depend on their momentum, there are gauge degrees of freedom. And so physical states will depend only on the zero modes and on the gauge invariant, in this case the Mohan Sasaki invariant. Okay? But they still have to satisfy the only constraint that is remaining in the system is the zero mode of the Hamiltonian. This is similar to what we are doing in, in homogeneous and uh, isotropic cosmology because we are only left at the end of the day with one uh, constraint. The only thing that this constraint mixes everything, including the perturbations. Okay, now some formulas, uh, not many, but at least. Okay, so this is the, the aspect of this constraint. You have the homogeneous isotropic contribution with the uh, square of the inflaton momentum. This part is uh, essentially the geometry part plus the potential of the inflaton. And here you have the contribution of the perturbation. There is a part that is linear in the inflaton momentum and the other is independent of it. This in particular is similar to what you would have in a harmonic oscillator, okay, with the frequency that corresponds to the Fourier mode. In fact, the function that multiplies the Muhan Sasaki uh, variables square and their momenta square is simply the square of the scale factor, corrected in this case. And then you have like an effective mass that depends on the potential and on the geometric part of the background. Uh, concerning this part here, the only thing I would say is that it's quadratic, the Mohan Sasaki variables are proportional to the uh, derivative of the potential. And the very, very important thing is that all these functions that appear here, uh, in fact, just reduced to three functions of the background, they are completely independent of the mode that you are considering. It's the same, they are the same for all modes, okay? This is uh, the important thing. Well, uh, up to now, in fact, I have not uh, referred much to loop quantum cosmology. You can do this with any quantization for the background, okay? You will need a quantum prescription for this homogeneous part, asymmetrization here, because this part depends also on the inflaton, and this is the moment on the inflaton, and certain prescription for, uh, to represent the background fa functions that appear here, that, the, as I said, there are only three of them, okay? And we expect that in many physical situations, this part here will not be relevant because it's uh, proportional to the derivative of the potential. Okay. Now, in order just to try to extract physics from there, the idea is essentially to use a separation of variables. Okay. So we take a states that depend just on the homogeneities and on the scale factor. And we use as an internal time, in this case, the uh, scalar field. Uh, even more, we can choose uh, uh, states for the Freeman uh, Lemaitre Robinson Walker geometry that are, let's say, close to the homogeneous evolution in the sense that uh, we can even think that uh, there is a unitary evolution operator for them and that is generated by a certain Hamiltonian. So that at the end of the day will be almost a solution to the homogeneous anisotropic. A constraint. If it's uh, so, then the back reaction will be negligible. If it's uh, a little bit away from that homogeneous and isotropic evolution, then there can be <coughs> a back reaction of the same order of the perturbative contribution to the zero mode of the scalar constraint. Okay, and so the, the real approximation that we do is to assume that there are not uh, relevant transitions in the homogeneous anisotropic geometry that are mediated by the perturbations. If it's so, essentially the expectation value will have the relevant information about that the scalar constraint. And in this way, you obtain a kind of master constraint for the perturbations, okay? When you take the expectation value, this is done just with respect to the geometry, Okay, there is a dependence in the inflaton that appears just uh, like, uh, as I say, as an internal clock. 
and the rest of the dependence goes with the perturbations, okay? So in this sense, it's like a master equation for them. A more open approximation here will be to disregard the uh, variation uh, with respect to the inflaton of the perturbation with respect to that that corresponds to the background, okay? Then, if you neglect this, essentially you arrive to a Schrenger-like equation. Uh, this term here, in, I mean, in many physical situations can be neglected. Uh, you can have problem with unitarity otherwise, okay? That's why I have written it. Uh, but you can always include it in, in the Schrenger-like equation. Even without this approximation, which you are neglecting that term, I mean, without that approximation, if you admit that this is a semi-classical counterpart because this is quadratic in the perturbations, then you can derive equations for the perturbations from there, okay, directly. And these are the equations that you obtain for the gauge invariance. So these are the Muhano sasaki variables and you get a second order uh, equation of propagation. The time that appears here is a conformal time that is defined by your quantum state, okay? So the state that you are giving in the background defines the conformal time, and then you obtain an equation in which the first thing is that the, the square frequency appears always there, and the other thing that appears here is independent of the mode that you are considering, so the ultraviolet behavior is like the standard one. Okay, in general relativity. This, that would be something like the potential, like the effective mass, is the only thing that you have changed, is a ratio of expectation values in the quantum geometry. What is A tilde? Uh, A tilde is the skill factor after you have corrected it with this uh, contribution of the perturbation so that it remains canonical, okay? Yeah, you, you, you quantize, you make it correspond to, I, I have not made the explicit the quantization yet. I think it's next, I, I think it's next uh, one because this can be done with any quantum prescription that you want. So you quantize it, okay? It depends on what is your choice, you will have a representation or other, okay? But the properties we, in this sense are quite general, okay? And the quantum corrections are just uh, captured in, in this part here, okay? So this is uh, the implementation in loop quantum cosmology, okay? If we use the standard variables, the volume and the V connection, okay? This is the physical volume of the spatial section that is proportional to this V. Uh, there is an orientation sign in this uh, uh, lower case V. This essentially could it corresponds to the uh, momentum of the logarithm of the skill factor, this is the usual one. Uh, here there is a choice of factor order, the, the one that uh, is uh, called the MMO prescription. The important thing in this representation is essentially the V that is a connection because of the holonomy representation becomes a sinus of V, okay? And this is the a standard uh, representation of the uh, homogeneous isotropic constraint uh, in loop quantum cosmology with the contribution of the potential and this is the square volume, okay? As you see here, what appears is the square of this uh, operator. Now, the other thing is that is the, uh, are the three functions that appear in the uh, contribution of the perturbation. This is the square of the skill factor that uh, Jurek was uh, commenting. Uh, and here you have the representation in terms of the volume. Uh, this is just uh, uh, an operator that you can construct with the ones that you have used already in the homogeneous isotropic case, okay? Uh, everything that appears here. Well, this is the inverse volume that is typical in loop quantum cosmology. And the only thing comes with this term that goes with the linear contribution of the uh, inflaton momentum. Uh, the operator appears here is very similar to this one. The only thing is that you are doubling, uh, in a certain sense, the frequency of the sinus so that 
the superselection sectors of homogeneous and isotropic loop quantum cosmology are stable under it. Okay. Okay, so from that point of view, the, the first question is, you have this effective mass and you have to compute it, calculate it. There were uh, quantum expectation values. So there are different strategies that you can follow from more accurate and complicated to uh, more practical and easy ones, okay? Obviously, the first thing, that, the, the most uh, accurate thing that you can do is to have the exact quantum solution for the physical states of the background and use them for the expectation values. This requires numerical integration for general potentials, uh, okay? And, I mean, complicated, but you can use clusters, uh, numerical simulations, and you can do it, okay? In most cases, uh, I would say that the, the best approach that is also very accurate is that uh, you will be in situations in which uh, the potential will be either negligible or will have uh, a constant contribution and then you can use a Dyson series in an interaction picture around the massless case of the De Sitter case, okay? And this will give you, you can compute in this Dyson series as much uh, terms are needed to have the precision that you want, okay? But in most cases, what we have done in the community of loop quantum cosmology is to go even further and use the states for which the effective description of loop quantum cosmology, homogeneous and isotropic one is valid. So instead of calculating the quantum expectation value, it's just evaluating it in the effective dynamics, okay? So even so, you still have to do the integration of the muhanov sasaki equation. And for that, you need initial values in two different kinds of things. One is the background, even you have these effective dynamics, and the other is for the perturbations themselves, okay? So let me go as fast as I can. The first thing is concerning the background. You have, typically in loop quantum cosmology, okay, you have a bounce in which the Hubble parameter vanishes, and then you have superinflation until this Hubble parameter is of order one in Planck scale, okay? So there is here like an scale that is typical, that comes from quantum gravity, you can say loop quantum cosmology, okay? And then there will be a period, in which you have the inflation that is driven by the inflaton, okay? There will be a region in midway in which this inflation starts, this is the onset of the inflation, and this is the second scale that is important for your problem, okay? Now, depending on the initial conditions of your background, you will have different possibilities. One of them, I mean, clearly is the region between the, the two energy scales, the one in which you are changing the story with respect to general relativity in a significant way, okay? And therefore, your, expect, uh, your hopes of finding quantum effects will be between these two energy scales. If the modes affected by these have re-entered the horizon and now in a part of the spectrum that corresponds, let's say, to the multiples in which the uh, the matching with general relativity is perfect, then you have a problem, okay? Because this either means that quantum effects are not observable, or this means that your theory is wrong. So, but for you. If those modes have not re-entered yet the horizon, then this means that you cannot observe them, and then this is also bad for you, because this means that there is no hope that you can make any prediction about quantum cosmology that is observable. So, in this sense, the best hope that we have is that those modes are re-entering the horizon, the cosmological horizon, more or less nowadays, okay? And this means that your initial conditions are constrained in this sense if you want to have that physics in a significant way. So, this concerning the initial conditions for the background, the natural thing to do is to look at that region of parameter space, you can say there is a fine tuning. Uh, the, the other part is that if it's not like that, then forget about having quantum effects, 
in the observable spectra. Okay. Now, if you do that, the f I mean, there, there, are some th there is something that most of the people, I think, are not aware of, is that, yes, inflation starts, but at the very beginning, you don't have a slow roll regime. And precisely for the modes in which you have quantum effects, they first uh, exit the horizon when the slow roll regime has not started. So this means that you will have deviation from the standard slow roll spectra coming from two different kinds of effects. The first thing is, is not a slow roll, and the second thing you have quantum effects. Okay? And the, then we have the challenge to be able to separate these two kinds of effects there. Obviously, from what I have said, it's clear that those modes will not, when they exit the horizon, they will not be in bunch Davis vacuum. Okay? So the problem concerning the initial value of the perturbation is finding a reasonable vacuum for them and that comes from certain first principles. Okay? Uh, the spectrum, the, I mean, you don't have to, to recompute the spectra for new vacua. Yeah? You use the old one, and then there is like a factor that modulates it that comes from the volume of transformation that changes the vacua. Yeah? Uh, there have been several proposals, uh, one by Ashtaka and Gupt, in which you have a nice interplay between the fluctuations in around the, the bounds, keeping them minimal for the bile curvature, and asking for a semi-classical or a classical behavior in the observational uh, uh, region. Uh, uh, Daniel Martin de Blas and Javier Olmedo propose another vacuum that, is, uh, that fits very good uh, the spectra and that essentially minimizes the oscillations in the spectrum. Okay? So, Essentially, with that, I think that I am going to conclude. I suppose that uh, I have transmitted both the, the, the feeling that we have good techniques to deal with the problem and that we have serious problems to think about also. Okay? Uh, so, as I say, I started with the quadratic uh, truncation of the action, found canonical transformation for the full system, including Mohan and Sasaki gauge invariant, then using a hybrid quantization for them, and uh, with a reasonable Lancet for the states, deriving F, uh, Mohan and Sasaki equations in which the quantum corrections are included. Okay? And the issue of how, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, how successful we will be in extracting pre prediction will depend uh, critically on our ability to, to find uh, reasonable initial conditions for, for the problem. And just to finish, okay, I want to, to show this picture of Jure that in a certain sense for me symbolizes the motivation that he has always transmitted to everyone in the community, mainly to the young people, but also to, to the colleagues of his generation. Okay? Uh, for me, this sentence, this uh, work that you presented in Loops in Madrid, it was done with Cristina, and the, the, this sentence, the, but there is no quantum gravity. Wrong. <laughs> there is quantum gravity, okay? And we have examples of them. This is nice. Um, at least for me, it's a motivation to continue in the, in the fight. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Yes, Jurek. Uh, <clears throat> recently, Wojtek Kaminski studied uh, quantum volume operator in loop quantum cosmology, and he found some very peculiar properties of Hamiltonian evolution, which doesn't preserve the domain to this extent that every state gains infinite volume in infinitely short time. So does it, is it any obstacle in your, for, for, for your model? I mean, in, in principle, I, I would say that it's not intrinsically a problem, although it's true that you have to be very careful. One of the things that we do usually is just to compute the expectation values, for instance, using this effective dynamics that is derived for certain variables, not for all of them. Okay? So in this sense, it's also, in my opinion, good to have the quantum 
Oh. I see. So your, your dynamics is quantum at the first place. In and principle, yes. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, if you want, you take expectation values, but if you don't want, you... I mean, the first thing is that these are genuine expectation values, okay? So you put there your state and you take the expectation okay. value. So here, here so, and these are operators and you can... So here uh, it would matter. You can analyze the domain of the operators and see whether these are expectation values are well defined or not, okay? Another question is, what is comparison between uh, predictions of your model and Abai, Abai and, and, and collaborators, I mean, yeah. Ivan and others? This recorded. <laughs> I mean, uh, for, for a long time, in fact, uh, Jorge, that is uh, uh, the bottom line there, uh, he asked me in Tux whether there's going to, to be any change in the predictions. At that time, I, said, I really doubt it, okay? Because it's true that many of the things of the two formulations are similar. What happens is that if you really are looking for quantum effects, the important region is this one. Otherwise, what you are detected is not quantum effects. And believe it or not, in this region here, the effective masses that you obtain are totally different in the dress metric and in our case, not, I mean, it's not something so deep. It's simply that we have followed the canonical formalism while in the dress metric, at least in the original uh, proposals, they were using the effective dynamics to compute time derivatives. And the result is not the same. When you use, for instance, for the second time derivative of the scale factor use the effective dynamics is not the same as you first express this uh, second time derivative in a canonical way in GR, and then you obtain the, the, the function phase space that correspond to it and evaluate it in the effective uh, dynamics. It's not the same. There is no commutation in this uh, Poisson bracket. So in that sense, the, the effective mass will be different just in the region where quantum effects are important. Okay. Francesco. I would like to comment on uh, the problem of initial conditions. Because uh, with the kind of techniques that we are using here, the initial conditions comes as a, an external input. Uh, and uh, if we have to predict them, uh, what would be for you uh, the strategies that we can follow? I mean, uh, Although I went fast, I, I tried to communicate both things. In the case of the background, my opinion is that it's either that we can observe quantum effects or not. So this will lead us to a certain region of the parameter space. With respect to this, I think there is something more fundamental um, um, and deep in the sense that we know that the vacuum state is the state that is better adapted to your background in a certain sense, okay? Here is a quantum background, but the, this perturbation should be uh, adapted in the most suitable way to that uh, background dynamics, okay? So, for instance, this proposal is something I like in the sense that it's telling you how this adaptation can uh, come. The only problem is that if, uh, in this case it's a variational formulation and this not the kind of, uh, of formalism that we want. We want the initial conditions. But clearly, okay, the idea is that whatever is a vacuum is adapted to a background. If the background has symmetry, the vacuum is invariant that day. If it has no symmetry, the transformation that you have is dynamics. Okay? Maybe one more question if there is one. If not, thank you very much again. <laughs>